Let's talk about Wardenburg syndrome here. Um, so this is a group of genetic disorders that features variable hearing loss, facial anomalies, as well as pigmentation defects of the hair, skin, and eyes. Particularly uh, stereotypic of this disorder is that white forelock uh, at the front of the hair uh, that you can see as early on as birth if the baby has enough hair. It accounts for 2 to 5 percent of all congenital hearing loss cases, which is significant considering that this is a relatively rare disorder, affecting about 1 in 40,000 worldwide, although there is some geographic variance uh, in Central Africa, uh, Kenya, it's about 1 in 20,000, which is a little bit more common, uh, and then in Northern Europe and Holland, uh, it's about 1 in 212,000, so much more rare than uh, the worldwide average. If you were to walk into a classroom in a school for the deaf, you would probably be able to point out one child that has Wardenburg syndrome, because about 1 in 30 students in such a school uh, will have uh, this disorder. The pathophysiology remains unknown at this point. Uh, there are some theories that uh, that point to that this is possibly a neural crest cell issue, um, and we do see in uh, in uh, some cases of Wardenburg syndrome that Hirschsprung's disease is a, uh, a feature. Uh, we also see constipation as a frequent symptom in uh, most Wardenburg syndrome cases. And so uh, the thought there, since we know Hirschsprung's disease is a neural crest cell migration disorder, uh, neural crestopathy, um, there's the, the thought is that this possibly relates to the neural crest cells. But uh, none of this has been uh, definitively proven, so the jury is really still out on this. So one note, don't confuse these two similarly named disorders, Wardenburg syndrome and Wallenberg syndrome. Wardenburg syndrome, of course, is what we're talking about, this rare congenital disorder that uh, can result in sensory neural deafness, pigmentation abnormalities, abnormal facies, characteristic white forelock, so forth. Wallenberg syndrome is an acute neurologic condition. This is where uh, you lose circulation to the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which uh, results in damage to the lateral medulla. Um, so this is also called lateral medullary syndrome. And this is going to cause those uh, the, the flipped uh, syndrome of where you have uh, loss of temper, uh, temperature and pain sensation on the ipsilateral face and loss of temperature and pain sensation on the contralateral body. Uh, you can also get some cranial nerve issues with Wallenberg syndrome, uh, particularly affecting uh, the vestibular nerve uh, as well as uh, cranial nerves 9 and 10. Okay, so there are four types of Wardenberg syndrome and several genes have been implicated. You don't need to memorize these genes, I'm just including them here for informational purposes. Uh, all of these are going to include those pigmentation abnormalities. It's probably the most salient feature of Wardenberg syndrome, white forelock. Uh, you can have uh, areas of skin hypopigmentation. Um, uh, you can have uh, abnormally colored irises. Uh, type 1 is pigment. This is your classic Wardenberg syndrome, really, is pigmentation abnormalities plus hypertellurism as well as other characteristic facial features. This is a uh, mutation of PAX3, which is on the long arm of chromosome 2, and this regulates a gene called MITF, uh, and that gene is actually to blame uh, for type 2 Wardenberg syndrome. Uh, if only that gene is mutated, then you will not have the hypertellurism that we classically associate with most cases of Wardenberg syndrome. Uh, type 3 is pigmentation abnormalities with upper limb abnormalities, uh, particularly of the wrist. And this also has to do with PAX3. I'm not exactly sure how you get type 1 versus type 3 with mutation, but uh, uh, this is associated with the same gene. Uh, you'll also see this particular syndrome, type 3, referred to as Klein-Wardenberg syndrome. So this is upper limb abnormalities. Type 4 is pigmentation abnormalities along with Hirschsprung's disease, which is typically diagnosed early in life. This can be uh, associated with a couple known genes, SOX10 and EDNRB. Types 1, 2, and 3 are going to be inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, and then type 4 appears to be autosomal recessive.
There are diagnostic criteria for Wardenberg syndrome. There are five major criteria and five minor criteria. In order to make a clinical diagnosis of Wardenberg syndrome, you need to meet either two major criteria or one major criteria plus two minor criteria. So the major criteria is any degree of sensory neural hearing loss. Remember that we're going to be screening all babies for hearing loss. Uh, when they're in the uh, when they're in the newborn nursery, so uh, this is something that we can pick up on right away. Uh, iris pigmentation uh, anomalies. So there's various different ways that this can show up. You can have heterochromia iridum, heterochrom uh, heterochromia iridis, and uh, then this characteristic brilliant blue iris. Uh, particularly if you see this in people of color who tend to not have blue eyes. Uh, you'll really note uh, that this is abnormal. Hair hypopigmentation may not be noted right away because babies, some babies don't have a whole lot of hair, uh, but if they do have that white forelock, that's very characteristic of Wardenberg syndrome as well as another syndrome called Peebaldism, which you can distinguish sometimes uh, based on other features. I'll talk about that in our differential diagnosis. A dystopia canthorum is uh, a lateral deviation of the medial canthus, uh, and this is what sort of gives you that hypertellerism. Uh, and then also if a first degree relative is affected, that's certainly going to lend itself to a diagnosis. Minor criteria include skin hypopigmentation, a medial eyebrow flare, uh, which can uh, appear to be uh, just excess eyebrow uh, along the medial side of where the eyebrow should end, uh, going down the nose. Uh, a broad nasal root, hypoplastic nasal alley, and premature graying of the hair. So you can see that uh, there are a lot of different criteria. Uh, no patient is going to have all of these. Uh, patients will have different, uh, each patient is going to be different, and there's going to be different degrees of severity. So this is heterochromia iridum. Heterochromia iridum is where you have two different colored eyes, two different colored iris. So here you see that sort of a brilliant blue iris uh, that we characterize uh, with Wardenberg syndrome, but then this eye here is brown. This is heterochromia iridis. So heterochromia iridis is where you have two different color uh, in the same iris. So iridum two different color eyes, heterochromia iridis, is two colors in the same iris. Again, here you see that brilliant blue iris here, and then a little bit of brown pigmentation. Uh, so here's a patient who has a uh, synophorus, and this is just that, uh, that medial flaring of the eyebrow. It almost kind of looks like a unibrow, but usually a unibrow would connect up here. And so this is just coming down the nose. And then this patient also has heterochromia iridum as well. And then you can see that there's a lateral displacement of the medial canthus. Usually the me me medial canthus would come a little closer to the nose. Here's a baby with Wardenberg syndrome. Uh, this baby happened to be born with a lot of hair. And so that makes the diagnosis pretty easy. This is an example of what uh, the, the skin hypopigmentation would look like. Um, so one way that you're going to differentiate this from Peebaldism is that with Peebaldism, the, uh, the skin hypopigmentation tends to be symmetrical, uh, whereas with Wardenberg syndrome, it uh, tends to be, uh, it can be asymmetrical. Uh, not in all cases, but uh, it's just a tendency. Uh, but you can see the white forelock up here as well. So this child obviously is of African descent, uh, but these eyes are remarkable, and uh, children that are African certainly do not have blue eyes in the vast majority of cases. This tends to be something you would see more in Northern Europeans, but these blue irises are, are uh, pretty incredible. Um, you can also uh, note a little bit of white hair, and that's, of course, abnormal for a child. Uh, and then uh, he does have uh, a degree of hypertellerism. So this child also has the, uh, the white forelock. Uh, you can uh, see that there's hypertellerism here as well. 
slightly hypoplastic nasal alley here and a long philtrum. Uh, this gentleman has p baldism, uh, but I wanted to include this because this is sort of what Wardenberg's type 2 would look like, where you don't really have those characteristic facial features. His eyes are, oh, it's kind of hard to see since he's turned, but he doesn't have any of those ocular features. Uh, he doesn't have hypertellurism, uh, but he does have a white forelock. And so p baldism is part of your differential for, uh, for Wardenberg's. So again here you see a, an African male uh, who has blue eyes and a white forelock. That's very characteristic. Uh, so this woman has heterochromia iridis, uh, sorry, iridum, heterochromia iridum, uh, and then the white forelock. This gentleman also has heterochromia iridum. Uh, he has graying of the hair, but note that, uh, well, in addition to this hypoplastic alley broad nasal root um, and this medial flaring here, uh, he also has uh, this sort of asymmetric graying of the hair. And that's another thing that you can see too, more in adults. So the diagnosis can be confirmed with cytogenetic testing as usual in genetic uh, syndromes. Uh, and this is something that uh, you, know, you can do in any patient. It will be particularly helpful though uh, if you need to differentiate this from p-baldism. On your differential, usually it's pretty easy to tell these apart from some of them like albinism. This is, albinism is also hereditary, but this is complete depigmentation of the skin and hair. Whereas with Wardenberg's patients, they'll just have patchy depigmentation, de uh, if at all. Um, and their hair is typically pigmented with the exception of maybe that white forelock. p is really the one that is most difficult to distinguish. So this also has a white forelock, but uh, there'll also be uh, multiple symmetrical, uh, sorry, this should say hypopigmented macules, hypopigmented macules. Um, these patients tend to not have any hearing loss and they don't have the characteristic facies that you see in Wardenberg syndrome. Vitiligo also has patches of hypopigmented skin. Uh, but usually this is something that's acquired later in life, whereas Wardenberg syndrome will be evident early on. Vitiligo does not have any other symptoms. Uh, you're not going to have hearing loss. And, uh, you're not going to have the characteristic facies. You're not going to have any changes of the eyes. Uh, VKH syndrome also features skin changes like alopecia, vitiligo, and poliosis, but you're going to have a uh, very salient feature of acute uveitis here. Uh, VKH syndrome typically uh, develops uh, sporadically and it'll start out with flu-like symptoms, meningism, uh, dysacusia, tinnitus. It'll ultimately transition into a painful acute uveitis, decreased visual acuity. Uh, on fundoscopic exam, you uh, may see optic nerve edema, uh, hyperemia around the optic nerve. Um, and then ultimately, you're going to get choroid depigmentation, sort of a sunset, uh, sunset fundus, and uh, then the skin changes will come on. Uh, so this is uh, both vitiligo and uh, VKH syndrome come on later in life, whereas Wardenberg syndrome, uh, you're born with. So for management, there's really nothing we can do as far as treating the as far as curing the disease. This is genetic, so we manage this symptomatically, primarily focusing on the hearing impairment that tends to be uh, affect quality of life the most. Uh, so uh, early on, uh, when you diagnose uh, the child, uh, especially if this is a baby with type four Wardenberg syndrome, you're going to want to correct the Hirschsprung's disease um, if it's present. Uh, upper limb radiographs are useful to get on any patient you diagnose with Wardenberg syndrome since there can be upper limb anomalies. Uh, then uh, after that, you uh, will, if they do have upper limb defects, you'll want to have these uh, children get physical therapy uh, so they, that they reach their developmental milestones as quickly as possible. Uh, referrals are going to be desired uh, to an audiologist for hearing aids if necessary to a speech-language pathologist and to a clinical geneticist. Uh, 
Genetic counseling can be useful for parents as well. Most of these cases are uh, autosomal dominant and the parent will have Wardenberg syndrome. Uh, it runs in families. However, uh, in some cases, uh, you may have a sporadic mutation or it can be the autosomal recessive type, in which case uh, it's going to be important to have cytogenetic testing done on the parents. Long-term management, these patients tend to struggle with constipation. That can be managed with laxatives. However, in uh, a minority of cases, some patients will need to have colon removed. Uh, and that's not because the colon is, uh, that part of the colon or a particular part of the colon is not functioning. It's just to reduce the uh, amount of colon that's there uh, to sort of speed up the transit time. Preventative measures should be taken for sun exposure, and this really kind of goes for anybody, but particularly in these patients, they do have an increased risk of melanoma, so you'll want uh, them to be using sunscreen, SPF 15 or higher. Genetic counseling should be uh, offered to the patient since uh, they are going to be at risk for transmitting this disease onto offspring, 50-50 chance. Long term, most patients with Wardenberg syndrome function fully as adults. Life expectancy is normal. However, there are a minority of patients who have a slight intellectual deficit, uh, but that's a minority of cases. Some patients will struggle with body image issues. That has been noted in the general population with Wardenberg syndrome, and if this is uh, an issue, it should be followed with a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Um, this is something to just keep an eye on uh, as the child is growing up, particularly, particularly during adolescence. Um, if, if this comes up, you'll want uh, to manage this right away. And then finally, uh, these patients have an increased risk of rhabdomyosarcoma. I'm not exactly certain if there's any screening tests that can be done for that or any surveillance, but it is uh, the case that these patients do have an increased risk for that particular tumor. If you have any questions, go ahead and write me a comment below. I'll see you next time.